Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. There's no guideline for this talk tonight, you know, I... We got this book right here that says format. Ain't nothing in there about design for living talk. Ain't we hadn't done this before, so we're kind of doing it on the wing and the prayer and the trusting and the power greater than us tonight and we'll see where it goes. Uh when I came to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, I came from a nut war. They called it a treatment center. There wasn't nothing but nuts there, so I call it nut war. Some of y'all can understand. And I was the biggest one. You know what, what got me here in the end times, and I gotta share a little bit about it. What I share with you is not to impress you about me. It's just to simply tell you where this disease of alcoholism and drug addiction took me. Where I rode the train to. And I'm not gonna tell you everything but just a little bit. Suffice it to say, five years before I got to you, I was living in a house that I somehow still owned at that time. Take back man was getting ready to take back. I called my mama and asked her if I could come home. She said, you'd come home for two weeks. Clean up, get you another job, and get out of our house. I cleaned up that house that the take back man was going to take back. There were 42 pounds of empty beer cans on the floor. There's probably a thousand dirty syringes laying around. I used the bathroom in a five gallon bucket. I had no running water, no phone, no electricity, no heat, no nothing. And I didn't have a problem. Now that's where this thing took me, and the reason I know there was 42 pounds of empty beer cans on the floor is because I bagged them up and sold them to get a drink. Now that was five years before I got to y'all. So you can imagine what went on in the next five years. I came into the program of AA through that treatment center, and I thank God that they worked out of the book Alcoholics Anonymous. Treatment's changed now. I work in that field, and uh, you, you'd be hard-pressed to find the book Alcoholics Anonymous around where I work. You'd have to really scuff it. I don't like that, but that's the way it is. But I came in here, and, uh, and this design for living y'all talk about, for me, it comes from those 12 steps, and that's what they put me on when I was in treatment. You know, I did my first uh, fifth step. I was 40 days away from a drink. I was still pretty much humming. Mmm, you know that. Got to shake it out in there, but I was still humming. And people say a lot of times that's too soon to be that far into the steps. And I politely remind them if they'll read the literature, they'll find that Dr. Bob was walking around making amends about eight and a half hours sober. So maybe there, and there weren't no steps, but he was doing the amends process at that time. So don't worry about speed of the steps. I, I've heard people talk a lot of things about that, but I think it's when you're ready to do it. You know, I didn't do it because I wanted to, because I was happy about it, because it anything else. I just couldn't stand to live the way I was living anymore. And somebody told me this might work. So that's where I, that's kind of where I started. And, uh, you know, when this, we started talking about doing this deal tonight, I said, well, you know, where do you go to, where do you go to find out how to talk about this deal? So I started just looking in the book Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't know why. But in here, you know, the first place I found something mentioned about this deal was, um, He's talking in, uh, there is a solution. Imagine that. And this guy was, uh, he'd been talking to the 
to the doctor about why he couldn't get sober. You know, what's what's the deal? How come I can't get sober? He said, here was a terrible dilemma in which our friend found himself when he had the extraordinary experience, which we've already told you about, that made him a free man. You know, I always wanted to be a free person, but I always felt like I was enslaved. Not in slavery, slavery, but enslaved to something that was controlling me, that was, was making me do what I did. And I didn't know how to quit, not just the alcohol and drugs, but the way I lived. And then it comes on down and it says, What seemed at first a flimsy reed has proved to be the loving and powerful hand of God. A new life had been given us, or, if you prefer, a design for living that really works. I don't know about you guys, but I remember, even at a young age, looking at other people and thinking, how come they know how to act? How come they know how to get along? It's like they got something that I didn't get. And I knew, even then, I knew I wasn't that dumb. I mean, it wasn't a matter of intelligence. I just, you know, when the plane came in, I was at the boatyard, I reckon. You know, I mean, something. It just, I just didn't get it. And these guys, you know, as I grew a little older, came on up a little bit, and my eyes opened up and started seeing some of these other shaped like things, and they were called ladies, and I started looking at that, and other guys could talk to them, and my God, when they'd look at me, I'd run, want to hang on the wall. Scared to death. Petrified. Wanted to be with them, and scared to death that they, they would talk to me. So I think maybe that uh, that I didn't have a design for living from the get-go. And I uh, I kept on coming around here, and, and that same guy that I just read that talked about that design for living, he, uh, on the page back, he talked about, uh, in here it says, they appear to be the nature of huge emotional displacements and rearrangements. Ideas. Emotions. And attitudes, which were once the guiding forces of the lives of these men, are suddenly cast aside. And a completely new set of conceptions and motives begin to dominate them. And that started in that treatment center for me. Because I didn't have a clue how to live without using and drinking. Not a clue. I remember looking out the big picture window in that hospital and I looked up at the Big hospital up front, because they put us down there in the back, you know, where the real sick people were. And I looked out that window and I said, what in the hell am I going to do with all my time? I don't know about you guys, but I had gotten to a point with this disease that drinking and using drugs was my life. It wasn't a thought that happened every, on Tuesday or Thursday or it was every day, all day. I made a living. <laughs> I got broke at doing that. I didn't make a living at it. I got broke doing it. But uh, I started having some new, uh, some new ideas, some new conceptions, some new motives began to coming into my life in that treatment center because I finally, finally prayed to a God that I didn't understand. And I said, God, I don't know who you are. I don't know what you are, and I don't even know if you are. But if you don't do something with me in this life pretty quick, I'm checking out. And I didn't mean checking out of that hospital. I meant checking out of this life. I had had enough. I had gone as far as I could go. The battle was lost. I give up. I knew the answer wasn't any more in alcohol and drugs. You know, and I had I had contemplated suicide a lot. I think I was just too chicken shit to do it. Uh, of course, when that doctor in that hospital talked to me, the first question they said, you ever think about suicide? Nope, not me. Ain't nothing wrong with me like that. I ain't thinking about suicide. All the time. All the time it was on my mind. You know, and I, and I just kept on 
Um, thank God for those people in that hospital that that believed in me and they, they put me in this literature. And I've got several things. <coughs> I'm going to read little little bits and pieces out of them here because it was what was pointed out to me. I told you I'd, I'd gone up and done that first uh, fifth step. I was 40 days away from drink. I walked back in that nut ward, and a voice talked to me, and that voice had spoke to me 20 years before. That voice had said, Randy, if you don't quit drinking liquor, it's going to kill you. And I heeded the call. I didn't drink any liquor for 10 years. Not a drop. But that voice did not say anything about wine, beer, smoking pot, doing all these other drugs, taking trips and not ever going anywhere. You know, some of y'all been on those kind of real cheap, three or four dollars, go all the way to the moon and back. <laughs> been there, huh? And these people kept talking about these steps. And in the 12 and 12, you know, they pointed out to me and it says the 12 steps are a group of principles, spiritual in their nature, which if practiced as a way of life, there it is again, a design for living, a new way of life, a way of life. I think this whole program is about a new way of life. You see, you took the alcohol and the drugs out of me I didn't know how to live. I knew all about the way I did live. They told me I had to take the asphalt off myself. I said, what in the hell are you talking about? I had to get rid of the street. All the things I had learned while I was out there kept me surviving on the street. But they were of no use to me when I came in here. And I'm like, well, what do I do? What I, you know? I'm 42 years old. How are you going to teach this old dog new tricks? Once again, through the action of those steps, one day at a time, some changes have happened. You know, it's uh, it's more amazing day by day. I come in here and, and I hear guys come down here and share. You know, Scotty talked the other night. And I could relate to, to everything he shared. When I first got here, I wasn't nothing like him. When he shared, I'm like everything he said. And then Ben talked Saturday morning. Then Bill talked. And I relate to them, you know. I understand. And then Burns talked tonight. And I can relate to him. You know, I never did have no white Corvette. But I had a black Ford Starliner 427 with two fours and a four speed that pulled the front wheels off the ground and I was hell. I understand. I can get something on the outside to fix this poor boy on the inside, you know. That's the deal for this deal. What do I do? What do I do? Thank God they gave me a sponsor when I was in treatment. Uh, wouldn't let me pick one told me that I would pick somebody and then I would tell them how to work the program. Some of y'all know me now and you say, you still like that, Randy. Ain't changed a bit. You know, but I, I think I've got a little bit better and, uh, and I'm surrendering a little more day at a time. I uh, have to tell you that when, uh, when I got up here tonight, I was scared to death. Still got a little bit of twitching in me. Because there's a part of me that thinks, just like Burns said, I got to have your approval to be okay. And what if I get up here and I mess up? Now, how am I going to mess up? You know, even if I take a drink, y'all will take me out and talk to me and bring me down and help me get back started in the program. So getting up here in front of you ought not scare me to death, but it does. You know it does. So I went back there and prayed, and once again, I was able to give it back to that higher power that y'all taught me about. And I'm up here now. In the face of collapse and despair. In the face of total failure of their human resources. They found that a new power, peace, Happiness 
and a sense of direction flowed into them. This happened soon after they wholeheartedly met a few simple requirements. Uh Uh-oh. Rules and regulations and requirements. I don't know about you, but I never wanted to follow the instructions. I'd get something at Christmas, and it'd have a set of directions in there. You know the first thing I did? I throw them directions away because I know how to put everything together. And then, of course, it wouldn't go together, and I'd raise hell and say they left, they didn't send all the parts. You know, it wasn't my fault. Finally go get the directions back, find out that I'd put it together ass backwards again. Once confused and baffled by the seeming brutality of existence, any of y'all ever thought, well, why in the hell am I alive? You know, I told my first ex why in a fit of smartness, one Saturday morning, about 10 o'clock in the morning, and I'm fixing to get off on some kind of mushrooms or something, drinking a good cold Budweiser. Honey, them people from that other planet brought me here, and this is jail, and I don't know when they're coming back to get me and take me home. Now, that woman got scared to death. Would you? If you started talking to, to me about something like that, I'd have understood that she didn't understand. I thought this world was jail for the place that I came from because I didn't fit in. The seeming brutality of existence, they show the underlying reasons why they were making heavy going of life. There's that word again, life. How come life is so hard? How come I have to put up with all this stuff? How come God made me the smartest person in the world and all y'all are just dumb as dirt? How come I got to put up with dumb people? Any of y'all, I don't know if any of y'all ever thought like that, but I certainly did. And what it was, I was trying to compensate for my own lack of knowledge, my own lack of a design for living, if you choose to say it. Leaving aside the drink question, taking the alcohol out. They tell why living was so unsatisfactory. You know, I I can tell you today, I drank because it made me feel like life was okay. And when the alcohol quit working like it like I wanted it to work. Being a good shade tree pharmacist, I added other chemicals. And I abused them, and I did every one of them alcoholically. And I used everything I could get my hands on to try to be okay, to try to fit in, to try to be a part of the world, to be a, I don't want to say productive member of society, but just a member of society. You know, I just couldn't fit in. I did a lot of good things for a lot of people. I have to say that. But I always attached some kind of requirement on the end of it, you know. You're going to owe me later. I look back at my, my growing up time, you know, I played sports. I was good. I had uh, opportunities galore. When I got here, I told you I never had nothing. I was poor and downtrodden and beat down and pushed down and treated like a dog my whole life. And that's a lie. I wasn't. But that's how I perceive my life. <clears throat> you know, it uh, it came to me uh, one day that I was sitting around thinking, which is dangerous, that there was some power a whole lot greater than me that gave this world a spin some long time ago, however long. I don't know how they can count up millions of years. No way. That's just too much for me. But a long time ago. Just like a kid with a basketball on his finger, you know. And if if this world goes around once every 24 hours, if it was good enough for something that was powerful enough to do that, how come it couldn't be okay for me? I never wanted to live in the moment, in the now. I always was living in yesterday or what it's going to be like tomorrow. 
You know, now I, I sit around and I watch my grandkids. You're talking about people that can teach you about being in the moment. I mean, it's right here, right now. They ain't worried about nothing but what's right there. Y'all are starting to get me back to that point. Another thing in this book that helped me uh, start looking for a new design for living, and I like this a lot, because it nails me right to the cross. We were having trouble with personal relationships. We couldn't control our emotional natures. Y'all ever get mad and raise hell and just go off the damn bat? We were prey to misery and depression. Only when I didn't have another drink or another drug. We couldn't make a living. I could get jobs, never ever had a problem getting jobs. I just couldn't keep them. Those people expected me to come to work. You know, I don't know why. I ought to get a check for just signing on with them. We had a feeling of uselessness. We were full of fear. We were unhappy. We couldn't seem to be of real help to other people. I was stayed like that until I got into those steps. And today, most of the time, I don't live like that. Sometimes I get caught up in a little fear, and it's always, always a problem between me and my higher power. It's never the problem between me and you. You can't cost me that stuff. My lack of connection with my higher power is where that comes in for me. I uh, I remember uh, when I first asked Jimmy to be my sponsor. We had been running, uh, running up and down the roads of AA. And everywhere I went, there he was. And he'll tell you now, everywhere he went, there I was. But I hadn't had a sponsor for a little while. My sponsor, my second sponsor, had, uh, for his own reasons, had made a choice not to continue going to AA. I went to him and told him, I said, Jim, I, I don't, you know, you need to be in AA. I gotta have a sponsor in AA. And he said, well, Randy, some things you just have to go through on your own. And I told him, uh, you know, that ain't what you told me. So anyway, I didn't have a sponsor. And y'all know right now, if you're sponsoring yourself, you got a damn fool for a damn sponsor. So don't do it. Find you somebody. Anybody's better than nothing. And uh, so I finally asked Jimmy, you know, I said, uh, I got the courage up because I was, I don't know what I was afraid of, but I was afraid of something. You know, I, can, I don't have to have any certain thing to be afraid of. It can just be fear. I think I was afraid he'd say yes or no. Some of y'all can understand that. See, if he says yes, then I got to tell him some stuff. If he says no, then it puts me down. I uh, I had a deal go off one time. Uh, my my daughter called me one Thanksgiving, and I was really really sick. I had caught some kind of flu and flu bug and stomach bug, and I was like a fire hose. Every time I drink anything, it just go off. And she called me up, and we were having a little conversation. Right in the middle of the conversation, she said, "And oh, by the way, you're going to be a granddaddy." And my first thought was, I ain't got no grand, I ain't got no son-in-law. How am I going to be a granddad? And then I lost it. And I'd been sober a while. I lost my cool, and I went to ranting and raving and pissing and moaning and bitching and hollering and screaming and throwing stuff in my house. And I didn't have a bit of serenity, and I wasn't worried about God. I wasn't going to talk to that man. I knew what he said, dude. I didn't want to hear it. I wanted to kill somebody. And to hell with the consequences. But somehow or another, I called a, a friend of mine uh, in California. Of all places. 
Some of y'all know this man, Kip C. And I called him 8 o'clock Athens time, 5 o'clock his time. I ain't thinking about that because, see, I'm self-centered to the core. And I called him and he answered the phone and he said, what's going on? And somehow or another, this program that y'all have got me involved in, these steps, I was able to get kind of honest with him. I said, Kip, I'm scared to death. And he said, well, tell me about it. And I told him what was going on. He said, well, now it's 5 o'clock in the morning. He's laying in bed with his wife's brain out there. You know, and I know they're laying in the bed at 5 o'clock in the morning with each other reading the big book, Alcoholics and Dogs. That's what people do at 5 o'clock in the morning in California. Because what he said was, let's see what the book says. And immediately he went into, this is the how and why of it. First of all, we had to quit playing what? God. Now, how could I be playing God in this situation? Well, I was fixing to play God in whether this young man lived or died. And then what I was playing God as to how I was going to do with my daughter. So yeah, I was playing God. It didn't work. Next we decided that hereafter in this drama of life, boy, that was some drama going on then. God is going to be our director. He is the principal. We are his agents. I think Burns talked a little bit about that line tonight, being the spearhead and agent for God. And he is the father and we are his children. Most good ideas are simple. And this concept was the keystone of the new and triumphant arts through which we passed freedom. Once again, there's that word freedom. As long as I'm running the show, as long as I'm trying to control your behavior, as long as I think I know what's best, I am not going to be free. I'm going to be controlled by my own ego, my own self-centeredness. And you know, although I may tell you I believe in a higher power at that moment, I'm not really trusting that higher power. I may believe in that higher power. Now, I tell everybody up home when I'm talking, uh, uh, most of the time we get talking about belief and faith and trust and this stuff about this new way of living. And, uh, and I tell them, that I believe Carl Wallander walked across the steel cable about that big round up at Tallulah Gorge. I believe he did it because I've seen it. However, I do not trust him enough to get on his back and go with him. So I believe in this God that y'all taught me about, but how much do I trust this God? You know? I remember my first sponsor... I went to him, and some of y'all may have had these thoughts. I don't know if it's, I don't think I'm too unique with this. And I said, what if God wants me to go somewhere and be a missionary? And he looked at me with this the plainest look on his face and said, Randy, you're not that effing important. And <laughs> that kind of got me aback, and he said, but if that's where God wanted you to go, you'd go. What he was trying to tell me was that this power greater than me has got all the power. Like it says in the book, and I ain't got none. But yet I still think that I ought to be able to run the show with this problem right here. That my thinking, which caused me all the trouble that I ever had, is smart enough to run the show. Because I ain't had a drink in 30 days, 90 days, or Five years, or ten years, or fifteen years, or whatever. You see, Burns told us it ain't all. It ain't about the drinking. It's how do we live after the drink? That was my problem. How do I live after the drink? When you took away the alcohol, you had a scared little boy. Very scared. But I got in here and that sponsor said things like this right here. Reminding ourselves that we have decided to go to any length to find a spiritual experience. 
doesn't say that any length to stay sober, does it? Hmm. We ask that we be given strength and direction to do the right thing, no matter what the personal consequences may be. I had some hold back on that part. What if? <laughs> what if God wants me to go be a missionary somewhere? Well, I don't think God makes it too difficult on us for that. We may lose our position or reputation. Boy, I needed to lose my reputation. It was not a good one. I, I You know, I mean, whew, my position was uh, usually locked in a daggum bathroom somewhere. Some of you all understand that. Or face jail. But we are willing. We have to be. We must not shrink at anything. I had a guy say, well, man, I, you know, I, can't, well, I can't do that. I might go to jail. I said, well, what does the book say? He said, well, they told me I, need, I don't need to hurt. I said, what does the book say? I'm not going to argue with you. Do what my sponsor said. What does the book say? He says, we might. Doesn't say we're going to jail, says we might face jail. You know the consequences I had when I got here were that I had lost me. I had lost whatever remnants of Randy Parsons there ever had been. And I had became a total, 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 total person controlled by chemicals. Controlled who I talked to, if I talked to anybody, where I went, what time I got up, when I, or if I ever went to bed. Controlled whether I worked or not, whether I ate or not. When I checked into that nut ward, I hadn't eaten in two and a half weeks. I'd have one half of one biscuit in two and a half weeks. I couldn't keep food down. I could drink all I could drink and hold down. I tried to shoot whatever I could shoot to stay loaded. And there I was. I was hopeless and helpless and I was beat down and I, I didn't know a way out. But you people, you gave me something. You gave me this right here. Our design for living was not a one-way street. It's as good for the wife as it is for the husband. You know, I had uh, I had another ex-wife at the time I got here, and somehow or another she crawled into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous three and a half years before I did. I like to say she needed to get here before I did because she was sicker than me, but that ain't true. You know, I ain't no way she was near as sick as I was. But she was sick as she needed to get. Two weeks before I crawled into that nut ward, she had called me. She found a new design for living. She found a new way of life. She found new people. She found something that was leading her to a power greater than herself that could solve her problem. And she still cared enough about me, I guess, as uh, as the father of her child, to where she called me and said, Randy, uh, she asked me to keep that child, and I told her I couldn't. I was too sick. She said, Randy, there's help out here for you, and there's hope for you. And if you'll just come along with us, you can find that. And I wasn't quite ready, you know. I, I wasn't quite ready to do that deal then. And I uh, I had to go on a little more, but I finally got to that treatment center a couple of weeks later. And when I got out of there, uh, she helped me sort of put my life back together. I, she'd get, I had could have $2 a day. and she'd uh, If I spent 75 cents, she didn't give me two more dollars. She'd give me 75 cents to make it back up to $2. And I gave her my paycheck every week. So somehow something had changed. I mean, cause I never gave nobody my paycheck. And you know, guys, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tie on up here for me and get it over to Jimmy. But to suffice it to say that it's an ongoing process. 
You know, now I work in a treatment center. I sponsor guys. Try to stay in the book Alcoholics Anonymous. I pray. I do the deal. I come down here and be with you guys. You know, I do a lot of service work that I never would have thought I'd have done. That just ain't for me. You know, that's free labor. But I know today that it's it's stuff that helps me stay sober a day at a time. <coughs> you know, it's uh, it's just a true blessing today. You know, I have uh, me and my second ex-wife are living together again. We're not remarried. I haven't jumped that deep, but uh, you know, we're living together, and our lives are are okay today. You know, even when I get frustrated and I think, well. Damn, look how she's treating me after all I did for her. I have to remember what all I did to her. I want to conclude with this right here and turn it over to Jimmy and uh, reading from the step 12 and the 12 and 12. Still more wonderful is the feeling that we do not have to be specially distinguished among our fellows in order to be useful and profoundly happy. Not many of us can be leaders of prominence, nor do we wish to be. Service gladly rendered, obligations squarely met, troubles well accepted or solved with God's help. The knowledge that at home or in the world outside, we are partners in a common effort. The well understood fact that in God's sight, all human beings are important. The proof that love freely given surely brings a full return. The certainty that we are no longer isolated and alone in self-constructed prisons. And I lived there a long time. That surely that we need no longer be square pegs in round holes. And I think Burns talked about that tonight. These are the permanent and legitimate satisfaction of right living for which no amount of pomp and circumstance, no heap of material possessions could possibly be substitutes. True ambition is not what we thought it was. True ambition is the deep desire to live usefully and walk humbly under the grace of God. With your help, the guidance of a sponsor, those 12 steps, somehow or another, I'm able to, to do a little bit of that today. Guys, I don't know if I've helped you, but it's uh, been a blessing to be up here in front of you, uh, sharing a little bit of strength, hope, and experience, and I want you to welcome my sponsor, my good friend, Jimmy C. from Good Hope, Georgia. I'm Jimmy I'm an alcoholic. Y'all didn't hear that last comment. He says, I took up way too much of your time. No, he didn't. I hope he just keep on going. This sort of came about on a short notice for me, but uh, it kind of goes back to the early days. One is never say no to AA. And my sobriety date is December 10, 1989. And I can, glad to say, not bragging, but I can say that I have not said no to AA yet. And also, don't say no to your sponsor. Uh, he would, he don't accept refusals very easy. Randy Parsons is my sponsor. He told you I was his. The thing that, that, uh, brought that back, he told you everywhere we each other we went, there we were, and, uh, we talked frequently, and he was out of sponsor at the time, and I was too, I had one sort of semi-long distance, but, uh, Need somebody close. And I had a problem that, uh, I was working with somebody that I was afraid they'd go commit suicide, and I had done a tremendous amount for them, and it wasn't working. It just wasn't, wasn't working, but I was afraid to turn them loose, and I knew I could get an honest thing from Randy, so we, we thought, he said, you're putting more effort into their sobriety, their recovery than they are, that you've done enough. And I felt fine. I said, well, since you know as much about me, and we've been close for, he is already. I said, uh, let's just make it a fish. How about you being my sponsor? He says, well, I will if you will. So that brought us together. And it's our relationship and love for each other has grown tremendously over the last 13, 14, 15 years. There. But I don't know exactly how long it has been. It doesn't really matter. 
I know it is today, and it's a tremendous help to me. And it's not that we stay in contact with each other, uh, only fear of getting drunk. It's the fact that we talk about everything in our lives today. We share our lives. If we got a burden, we can share it with the other one and unload part of it. It's not as, not as heavy. He knows a tremendous amount about me. Just about everything about me knows. But we stay in touch four, five, sometimes six, seven times a week. I'm not saying everybody ought to do it, but we do. But, uh, and when he asked me to do this, I said, of course I will. And I don't, I made a few notes, but I didn't have time to prepare a great presentation for you. But I can go over what uh, has meant a lot to me in this big book. I love it. I read it a number of times all the way, all, I say all the way through, which means the doctor's opinion, the first 164 pages. The first stories, there's some good stuff in them, but they are first stories the same as mine might be or Randy's may be. But the first 164 pages in the doctor's opinion, in my personal belief and opinion, they are not set in concrete, they are set in steel. To me, it's, it, that is absolute. You believe what you want to, but to me, it's, it's where my life they came from. I didn't want the life I had, and I wish I could have gotten rid of it. Because I drank for a good many years, and life was not good. I was married for 10 years, and, uh, first, back the first nine months, so we were well, relatively happily married. But the thing is, she, my wife started trying to tell me what to do, and wanted to try to run the show, and that's not going to work. Because I'm the man, I run, I wear the long breeches, I'm in charge, I'm the ruler of the roost, and I don't take orders from no damn woman. And that was the way I felt. And I felt that was the right way to do it. And it was nine years of, uh, we had, we had, she had a child we married and we had two, two sons of ours. But the thing is, it was nine years of nothing but pure hell that I created and, she had a little hand in it, but, uh, cause she didn't want to be told what to do either, and that created a lot of trouble. And a lot of drink. And finally we divorced in, uh, after ten years. And, uh, the thing during that ten years, there was an awful lot of verbal abuse and a tremendous amount of physical violence. Because if I can't talk any sense into it, I'll beat it into it. I'm not proud of that, but I did it. We divorced four years and remarried. We were happily remarried for about, I don't know, six weeks, maybe two months at most, before she started trying to tell me what to do again, that ain't going to work. That just don't work. I am the man, I'm the king of the mountain, I'm the ruler of the roost. So we went through ten more years of extreme verbal abuse and physical violence again. But I would not have stayed with me 15 minutes tonight. She had to be have something wrong with her to, to stay with me that long. But, uh, and she's been a, a faithful and frequent member of al since I've been in AA. And it's, life has been different. But the thing is, I went to treatment, and, uh, I knew, well, like, I don't, I don't have time to go to the old story, but I was talking about our verbal abuse and physical violence. I got into the big book while I was in treatment, and I didn't understand what I was reading, but I read it. And I read it. I read what got out. But I can say that since I've been in AA, that we have not had one argument, or we have not had one fight, because I am not going to fight and I'm not going to argue, simply because the big book tells me not to. And that's, that has changed a lot of things, because there's a lot of things we don't agree on. And the times that uh, I can start a fight off something she said, because if I started, she'd pick it up, and it would go up, 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 till it blew up, and it was another fist fight. I'm not going to do that. Because the book had said, no, on, uh, after the night said, we have ceased fighting anything or anyone, even alcohol. Well, by this time, sanity will have returned. But when I got treatment, I followed directions. I was, it was strange for me, and I knew it. Because before I got uh, to treatment, and AA at the same time. I never believed in God. I believed in myself and another half a gallon of gilded gin if I needed anything to help me. Religion was for weak people. I was too strong. I didn't need none of that. And there's other things I don't have time to go into, but I had religion figured out to my, almost to my satisfaction. It was just a little bit that I could not 
quite get. And that was, how could so many hundreds of millions of people over so many thousands of years been so wrong? Or were they? I didn't believe, but I didn't understand why the others did. Uh, but I listened, I followed the direction, did what I was told. Being followed over alcohol, absolutely, because in the end, my drinking had gotten to the point I could not go over four hours around the clock without a drink. That's the longest I could go. A lot of black had to wake up in jail and have to ask one which one it is. Wake up on the side of I-20, out of a black hat, have no idea when you've been home, when you, whether you got to work, when you were fired. You don't know nothing. Some of the black hat people told me what it is, but a lot of them they didn't. But that went on a lot, and I had a number of DUIs. I won't go into all the details, but I had enough, more than, more than my share. But I was powerless over alcohol and you because alcohol controlled my life. I could, I'd wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning and give or take two minutes either way and I had to get out of bed and go get a drink. For a while, when it first started, my wife said, oh, you have to go get a drink? I said, no, I had to go to the bathroom. She said, what'd you do, pee in the kitchen cabinet? I said, no, ma'am. Then finally she didn't care. I'd wake up at 6, I'd have another drink. I'd get ready to go to leave and go to work at 7.30, I'd have another drink. I didn't want a lot of that drink. But I had to have it. Oh, I'd shake myself all to pieces. I'd stop at a convenience store, pick up a bottle of Scope and a pack of cigars. I'd drink that Scope from, uh, from good old Athens, which is about 20 miles. And I'd chew on my cigars. That's, a lot of days I remember going to work. But the last three years I wanted to commit suicide every single day, but I wanted to do it my way. And that was to hit a bridge sober. Why sober? I don't know. But I just want to do it sober because people think it's a real, a real actor. If I had a record, it would have drunk food and finally killed us if you'd go happen. But the harder I tried to get sober, the worse it got, the worse my drinking got. But I had given up when I got treated. And I listened, I paid attention the first time in my life. But a, a little power of alcohol, absolute. Life on management, certain, because alcohol run it, run, ran my life. It came to believe that a power of grand outside of could resort sanity. I had trouble there because I couldn't see how insane I had been. And the fellow too says, you need to find a higher power. Well, I didn't want to start talking no God shit to me. I don't hear it. He said, I'm not. He says, you need to find a higher power. Whatever your conception of God is, it does not have to be the God you believe in in church. Now, that made sense to me. I find my own. And at night I prayed. And I was honest and sincere, and I made a connection right then. I won't go into that story. But I made a connection, and your life is going to be different. And it has been. Because I did what he said to, and I got the results that was great. He needs to do a full step. When I did a full step, I found a lot about myself I didn't like. Very little I did like. Most I didn't. And the fifth was hard to do. But I was looking at myself, and I was reading the book and studying the book. And studying and reading it. And talking. And it meant, it had given me a design for living. Because on page 62, it said, self and self, so as that we think is the root of our trouble. It wasn't mine because I want everything my way. But I, that has changed tremendously. It also says, we had to quit playing God. And over the doctor's opinion, Dr. Silkworth had worked with alcoholics for probably 25 years before he and Bill ever met. He knew a lot about alcoholics, but he couldn't put quite everything together. But as Dr. Silkworth says, Prophet, emotional appeal seldom suffice. suffices. Don't beg an alcoholic to quit. Him, I bet he's hurting everybody in his life. He ain't going to do it. The message which can enter and hold these alcoholic people must have depth and weight. In nearly all cases, their ideals must be grounded in a power greater than themselves if they are to recreate their lives. And I was ready to change something. And I saw just what a total as I had been all my life. And I kept reading the big book and finding what it says and, and stayed involved in the steps. And also, uh, on page 66, it says, if we were to live... We had to be free of anger. And I didn't know at the time that I was mad at been mad at the whole entire world just about all my life. But I saw that. 
especially my wife, the kids, and anybody close to them. I did, could not see before the damage that I had done. Also, we avoid retaliation or argument. I don't argue today with anybody about anything over any reason. I can express my opinion and my thoughts and my beliefs. If you want to accept it, fine, but I'm not going to argue because I don't have to prove a point about anything. And it's also staying calm. That's on page 67. It said, we avoid argument and retaliation. Over page 98, it's in there several times. Argument and, argument and fault finding are to be avoided like the plague. I don't point things and blame anymore. I accept responsibility for my actions, but I don't blame anybody else. It's nobody else's fault. I want to blame everybody in the world before I got to AA. You caused it. You done it. If I had, I wouldn't drink like I did if you hadn't been so damn bad, so under, misunderstanding. I don't blame anybody today, anything. I don't have to point things. I don't want to. But the things that have helped me uh, tremendously is I found a higher power. I found God. And I did the third step and turned my life, my will over the care. That God as I understand. And I pray every morning, every night, and as many times during the day as I need. And But early on when I came up with a, a prayer that I, I didn't want anything that was printed, just that wanted to do mine. And part of that prayer is, is God, please help me hold my temple and my tongue, if it be thy will. And I have not been, I have, I'll get pissed off for a second. But as far as getting mad like I used to and violent rage, it didn't come. Because I've asked God to help me. And it has. I also asked him to help me stay sober. Not to keep me sober, because God is not going to keep me sober. And Randy Forrest is not going to keep me sober. They will help me stay sober if I want to, but I've got to do my part before anybody will help me. Uh, it's just, really, it's just that simple. Uh, but as far as on a daily basis, early on I, I tried to use, and until it became more obvious to me, I used the serenity prayer. Accept the things that I cannot change. Change the things I can, and wisdom will know the difference. And I found, too, that most that I can change is myself and my attitude. I can change my attitude. I can change me, but I can't change another human being on the face of this earth. And me fighting to try to change somebody else, it's fighting losing battle. All it does is get me hot and bothered and upset. It's not going to work. But I can change me and my attitude. And that's, that's, I can see most things that I think maybe could be changed, so I'll pray about it. Change the things I can. Sometimes I might change something I just don't really want to that bad, so I don't I don't bother with it. But I know what I can and can't. Well, thing is too is trying to show kindness to, to everybody. I wasn't kind to hold anybody before I got to AA unless you I could get a bottle out of it or drink. Just trying to show kindness. It doesn't hurt. It's it's not a. There's no reason that I can't do it, and I try to. And it's been a lot. Be intolerant of other people. Somebody may say something that's not exactly right, or, and, but I don't have to correct them. They may something, say something in English that's not exactly like it ought to be. I don't have to try to correct everybody. Be intolerant of them. Maybe they don't believe exactly the way I do. So work the steps the same way I have. I don't think it's one way, but that's my opinion. And it's just being different, being a tolerant of people. And also love of others. And love doesn't mean lust, trying to get somebody to be it. Love is having a care and concern for another person's welfare and well-being. That's what love is to us. And that's the reason I love all our colleagues. I have a care and concern about your well-being and your welfare. I want to try to help anybody with an alcohol problem that I can. If you want me to. If you don't want me to, that's perfectly all right. It's your goal. It's your business. But I'm ready and willing to help anybody as best I can. And it's, it's meant a lot. But, uh, in being tolerant, I would make, go make a little side trip Wednesday forward the workshop, uh, got started. I would load my truck. And my wife was helping me. That's amazing. She helped me. 
But the uh, thing is, she said, hand me another cooler. So I looked on the back porch, and I picked up the first cooler I got to. And I came back and set it back on the truck. He says, you don't need a cooler that big. I says, the only thing you said was, hand me another cooler. There is another, that is another cooler. And whatever she may have wanted, she didn't say nothing, but what may she may want to have said after that, I would have just kept my mouth shut because I've learned how to keep my mouth shut. I did what she asked me, and she said, well, that wasn't the size, but that's all right. I can let a lot of stuff like that go over my head, whether it's my wife or anybody else. It was not worth creating a damn service over. But prior to AA, that would have ended up in a fist fight, I can guarantee you. So it was no big deal. She didn't, I don't, didn't mean anything, wasn't trying to create anything, but she says things because I'll be with my wife, good piece. She's, I'm retired and she is too, and that's, we stay around each other sometimes, I think, too much, but that's my opinion, not hers. And, and being honest with, with people. I don't have to get up here, and I'm not up here to try to paint a big picture of what a, what a goody goody I am, and what a great fellow Randy Parsons is, and how well we, Work the program. I have to see people say, oh, my program and my program, it ain't your damn program. Uh, my program don't work. Hell no, it ain't gonna never work. The program of Alcoholics Anonymous will work. It does work for those who work it. It's so, but I don't, I don't have to jump in on somebody's case and say, unless they ask my opinion, then I can calmly give them my opinion. You ain't got a program. My program was to slow down so I could kill myself. But I couldn't do that, so my program didn't work. It's just so much an acceptance of people as they are and not as I want them to be. That's a big thing. I see people that I think need changing. I see a lot of people not here, not in here, but in, on the street that need changing. I have a daughter who's 45, and everything that had been, for, as far as I can remember, everything in her life is negative. Every single thing about her life is negative. Whatever she, the way she lives, whatever she drives, whoever she's working for, the people she works with, the kids, the other relatives, everything in her life is totally negative. I can only accept her as being the way she is and not spend a tremendous amount of time around her, which I don't, because I don't want to hear negativity every breath comes out of somebody's mouth. It's not necessary. I love her. As a dog. But I accept her being the way she is. And she may change, yes. But I cannot change her. And it's just, to me, it's trying to live the big book. And live the 12 steps. And reading the big book to see what it says that we should do. Uh, and not only there's just so much, there's so much in the big book that I could really talk all night about. I had underlined well, made some notes. But I won't get into that. I'll, I think I've talked probably about enough, uh, if not too much already myself. But what I try to do on a daily basis, I ask God every morning to let me know if there's anything I can do for you today. If there is, I'll do it. I got, well, about four years so I got a, what I wanted to do, and I heard a voice that was, I'm sure it was God telling me what to do. And I said, no, I can't do what you want to do. I'm going to do what I want to do today. I'll catch you later. Things didn't go my way. Nothing traumatic, or only well, traumatic, yes, but nothing drastic happened. But uh I wish I had not done that because that haunted me for over a year. I had to forgive and I know God forgave me, but I couldn't forgive myself. I was sitting on a brand new house, about four years old, nice, big house. But God had saved my life. God had given me another life. God had saved the marriage. God had done amazing, amazing miracles for me. But here I am saying, I ain't got time for you today. I have not done that again, and I will never. But I try to operate on a daily basis. Is whatever I say and whatever I do, to think a little bit ahead of time and say, would this be pleasing to God? If it is, fine, I can do it. If it's not, if I don't think it would be, I don't do it. No matter what it is, I don't do it. 
If I don't think getting up here would be pleasing to God tonight, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't. I wouldn't be to the workshop. I think it does. But I'd like to close with one thing we would about out of time. And uh thing that I like is called Fold the Rose. I don't know if any of you have heard it. You may have. <coughs> a young new preacher was walking with an older, more seasoned preacher in the garden one day. Feeling a bit insecure about what God had for him to do, he was asking the older preacher for some advice. The older preacher walked up to the rose bush and handed the young preacher a rosebud and told him to open it without tearing any of the petals. The young preacher looked in disbelief at the older preacher and was trying to figure out what a rosebud could possibly have to do with his wanting to know what God's will, what, know the will of God in his life and ministry. But because of his great respect for the older preacher, he proceeded to try and unfold the rose while keeping every petal intact. It wasn't long before he realized how impossible this was to do. Noticing the young preacher's inability to unfold the rose bow without tearing it, the older preacher began to recite the following poem. It is only a tiny rosebud, a flower of God's design, but I cannot unfold the petals with these clumsy hands of mine. The secret of unfolding flowers is not known to such as I. God opens this flower so sweetly that in my hands they die. If I cannot unfold a rosebud, the flower of God's design, then how can I have the wisdom to unfold this life of mine? So I trust in Him for leading each moment of my day. I will look to Him for His guidance each step of the pilgrim's way. The pathway that lies before me, only my Heavenly Father knows. I'll trust in Him to unfold the moments just as He unfolds the rose. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.